What's up, YouTube? So Donald Trump has officially announced what his second term agenda is going to be, and it looks like a fantastic, mostly fantastic uh, agenda here. So this is from Town Hall. And so he, they've segmented this into different, different categories. And so in terms of jobs, he plans to create 10 million jobs in 10 months. Now, that is a very lofty goal. But seeing what, seeing what Donald Trump has already done with the economy, I don't think this is going to be an impossible task. I think he will be able to do it. Now, he said he also wants to create 1 million new small businesses. That might be a little bit tougher. And I am interested to see what he actually has planned for accomplishing that. Whether whether there's going to be small business loans, maybe there's going to be some zero percent loans. That that would be awesome if he had zero percent business loans. Um, I, I don't know what that entails, but I would be interested to see what he has planned there because that is a very lofty goal. Cut taxes to boost take home pay and keep jobs in America. I know in, in the age of populism, it's it's kind of old school to be about cutting taxes and everything like that. But I do think that. That tax cuts and take home pay is incredibly important because, you know, as Vladimir Lenin said, the way to crush the bourgeoisie is to grind them between the millstones of taxation and inflation. And I think one of the biggest reasons that a lot of people who are in situations where they, they should be middle class, but for some reason they ha they're stuck paying rent because they can't save up a down payment to a home. They're they're kind of in that in that zone where. They're either living check to check or they're not quite living check to check, but they don't have the ability to save up for an actual investment that will generate wealth for them down the line. And I think that is that is a huge thing to tackle. So I am still on board with the with the low taxation crowd of conservatism, even though, you know, I, I agree with a lot of the, the Trumpian, more populist stuff that's come out over the past few years. So I, I think that's all very good stuff. Enact fair trade deals and protect American jobs. We have already seen him do that. He has um, gotten rid of NAFTA and backed the USMCA, the uh, US-Mexico-Canada deal. He has also backed us out of the TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership. And the Trans-Pacific Partnership would have just further cemented us being our economy being strip-mined by China, our manufacturing base and, and infrastructure being strip-mined by China. So I think it's a very good thing that he has... He, and, you know, I, I'm no expert on trade deals, and I'm no expert on what trade deals we actually have in place. You know, I knew about NAFTA, and I knew about the, the TPP, but I'm also wondering what kind of trade deals with places like Europe that could, that could be improved, or places like, um, you know, South America. I, I, I don't really know, but I would be interested to see him further pursue global, not, not global trade deals, but pursue trade deals globally that benefit America nationally. So made in America tax credits. I think that's I think that's another good thing. I mean, I'm not a big fan of corporate taxes as it is because I think corporate taxes, corporations don't pay taxes. And I don't mean that from the socialist bent that corporations get away without paying taxes. What I mean is that to corporations, taxes are a baked into the cake expense. So all that ends up doing is increasing the cost of business, the cost of products, the, pro the cost of goods and services. And those costs always get passed down to us, the consumer. So it, any tax on a corporation is essentially a tax on us, the consumer, of what that corporation produces. So I, I think that's, you know, but Made in America tax credits is a good step in that right direction. Expand opportunity zones. Now that's, opportunity zones, he, he's already been really working opportunity zones at a, I think, a record pace. I, I haven't really followed it too terribly closely. But the opportunity zones is essentially, you know, you'll get people on the left, they call it gentrification. But really, it's taking rundown areas and revitalizing them. And sure, there are some negative consequences of that, and that some people who live in that area, especially renters, may get priced out. But, you know, if you're a homeowner and you get priced out of the neighborhood, well, the benefit to that is that your home is now worth a lot more and you're able to get more out of it so that you can relocate to a place that is not, you know, not as bad as your neighborhood was before. And of course, yeah, there are people who don't want to relocate. It does put some people in a pinch. But at the end of the day, there's almost no situation where everybody benefits. And what would you rather have? Run down cities and area that, uh, I mean, run down areas and cities, places that look like Baltimore, that look like. I mean, or Detroit that look like nuclear disaster zones. No, I would rather have those places built up so they're looking nice, looking clean, creating jobs, which then can also trickle that. Uh, I, I just, I just, I just, 
stumbled into a left wing trap with the by saying trickle down because trickle down economics was not what we called it. it that was uh <sighs> surrendered the premise on that one go ahead and beat me up in the comments there uh, but you know what I'm saying that, that they will spread outside of just the opportunity zones and create jobs for people that are living in surrounding areas that might not be as built up that's what I'm talking about continue the deregulatory agenda for energy independence now this is one thing that I don't think gets enough credit in the Trump administration I've got a buddy it's more of a friend of a friend who um he works at a think tank in Washington. It's a conservative think tank, but he knows a lot of people that work in the regulatory departments, the regulatory bureaucracy. And he says that they absolutely love Trump because we have absolutely no grasp on what the Trump administration has done already to uh, tamp down regulations and make it easier to start businesses, make it easier to get things going. So apparently he's done a lot more in that sector than I think most people are even aware of. And so to see that continue, I think is a very good thing. So we have eradicate COVID-19. All right, develop a vaccine by the end of 2020. I honestly, I don't care. I don't care about a vaccine for COVID-19. In fact, I probably would not get a vaccine for it. Uh, and and I'm, I'm not and I'm, I'm not saying that from some sort of conspiracy theorist vaccine. You know, they're, they're going to microchip us. But at the end of the day, I just don't think it's that big of a deal. I don't think I need a vaccine for it. And I, I'm sure as hell I'm not going to be one of the first people to get a vaccine for it. If you know, if if I were to ever get a vaccine for it, it would probably be years down the line when when you know more research has been done. But at the end of the day, I just don't care. I just don't care. Return to normal in 2021. That's what I do care about. Returning to normal. Returning this country to its regular operating procedures getting back businesses back open, getting schools reopened, getting people back to work and getting people out of their damn apartments. You know, I'm actually, I'm recording this video from a different place in my apartment because I needed to change the scenery. I thought maybe a little bit of depth in the back might, might make it look better. So let me know what you think about, you know, recording from, from this location. I'm also on my iMac and I'm thinking that it might, might expedite export times because my, my MacBook Pro, it's just, it's, it, the export times are ridiculous and I'm trying to streamline my process so I can bring you guys more content. Uh, anyways, off of that tangent. So, return to normal in 2021, make all critical medicines and health supplies, uh, critical medicines and supplies for healthcare workers in the United States. And I think that is going to be a huge, huge benefit. We, we will have to figure out how do we, make in America and try to keep costs down. So that that's going to be a, a balancing act that we're going to have to work on. But we do not want to find ourselves in a situation like we found ourselves in with COVID-19, where China had all of the manufacturing for medical supplies, and they basically had us by the balls. That is not a good situation to be in. We never want to be dependent on another country. That is why manufacturing and bringing it back to America is so crucial. Because if the world falls apart, if we have falling out, if we have different falling outs with different countries, um, if if there's you know world war and we're not on the same side as one of the people that we rely on, i.e. China for uh, for our materials, we're screwed. And that's why I also think I want to see Trump revisit Greenland. You know, I was so excited when Trump talked about possibly buying Greenland because the our, our, our mining technology is getting to the point where we can get through some of the some of the permafrost and some of the ice and all of that. And Greenland is extremely rich in rare earth minerals. And so I think that Trump needs to actually make a push for trying to acquire Greenland and make that a mining zone for us. Because we can get a lot of the rare earth minerals and materials that we rely on China for out of Greenland. So I think that would be a huge, huge plus. And I mean, honestly, what's there, 50,000 people in, Den in, in uh, Greenland? And they belong to, I think, Denmark. And Denmark immediately shot down the idea of buying Greenland. Well, you know what? You're Denmark. We're, we'll, we'll, buy that, we'll buy that from you. And we'll set terms that you're going to find agreeable. But you're going to agree to it eventually. You know, that's that's my take on it. But I want Greenland to be part of America, or at least American territory. Um, so refill stockpiles and prepare for future pandemics. You know, I, I don't know a whole lot about that. Of course, Trump has said that the cupboards were bare under the Obama administration. I would not, I would not doubt him on that. I would think that they probably were pretty bare. So end our reliance on China. Okay, this is this is what I was talking about a minute ago. Bring back one million manufacturing jobs from China. 
I mean, I think that he could probably bring back more than that. We are still likely going to have to rely on some foreign manufacturing from places like India, um, where the conditions are a little bit better and it's not as autocratic of a, of a government. I would love to see more, manufa more manufacturing jobs brought back, and I think he's going to help incentivize that with the Made in America tax credit. So tax credits for companies that bring jobs back to back from China. I think that we need to almost put a moratorium on outsourcing work to China. Now, I, I, that would be a very difficult thing to accomplish and overnight. And it would be tough to do that without them catching on and souring our relationships to the, to the point where either it starts a war or they dispel all of our manufacturing and all of a sudden we don't have that base and we haven't had the chance to set up the infrastructure here in America to actually have that manufacturing base here. So that's that's going to be something to keep an eye on. It's going to be a difficult it's going to be a tricky thing to navigate, but you know, if anybody can do it, I think it's going to be Donald Trump. He is he wrote the art of the deal and and he he's shown, he's proven that he knows how to make deals throughout his presidency. So, let's see what else we have here. Um, no federal contracts for companies who outsource to China. All on board with that. No federal contracts for companies that outsource to China. That's We should not be working with companies that make their money off of the slave labor that China uses. So all on board with that. And, and also, it's, it's not even just an issue of the slave labor. I mean, that, that is an issue. But when you're doing business in China, you're likely doing business with the Chinese government. And we don't know what the Chinese government is actually requiring from people who do business in China. So there's a there's a lot of things that I'm, I'm sure maybe there are people in the State Department that know about this kind of stuff, but I personally don't. But I, I do think it is something that should be considered. But yeah, I'm all about no federal contracts for companies who outsource to China. Hold China fully accountable for allowing the virus to spread around the world. Yes, we need to start holding China to account for everything that they do. And I think that I think I think you know where I think that starts. All of that debt that China has bought up that we now owe China charge it to the game it's over we don't owe you a damn thing um so i think i think that is going to be a um you know we'll, we'll see how he handles it it might be difficult to go ahead and you know charge all the debt to the game like that but ideally that's where i would land so health care cut prescription drug prices now trump has already started to do this um you you heard him talk about when he was talking in cleveland when he was talking at the uh, at Whirlpool, that's, that's what it was, Whirlpool. He was talking about how he is cutting out the middlemen and he is working with favored nations deals. So what we have is a situation where, because we do not have socialist medicine and we don't want socialist medicine, but there are a lot of countries that do have socialized medicine. And what they're able to do is negotiate as an entire country where we have to, where with us, it's they negotiate with our insurance companies. And our insurance, our insurance companies don't have nearly the leverage that an entire national government is going to have, say Canada or Britain or any, any other place. So, you know, I would like to see Trump figure out how to work out that favored nations deal and get us the lowest drug prices in the world, namely because we've developed most of the technology that comes into developing these drugs. So we should get the lowest prices on them. But again, we have been we have been strip mined by the rest of the world. We've been taken advantage of by the rest of the world where we create these drugs, we pay exorbitant amounts for them, and then they get them for pennies on the dollar. Uh-uh. Uh-uh. End that. End that. So the next line item is put patients and doctors back in charge of our healthcare system. I think that's a very good thing. In fact, I think the insurance companies have too much control over it. The healthcare system has become entirely opaque to the point where you can go to a doctor and you need an operation. You ask them, well, what does that cost? And they won't even be able to tell you. They don't even know the price of their own services. That is a very, very big deal. That is a very, very big issue because then this, you know, you, the, the insurance companies can charge whatever the hell they want for it. So it's it's really um, we do need to put patients and doctors back in charge. It's it's the only it's the only aspect of our economy that is t entirely run by a oligarchical or oligopolic. <laughs> How do you say oligopoly in in, a, in another form? Uh, it's it's run by an oligopoly of insurance companies that get to set the market, and that's that's not good. That's not good. So lower healthcare insurance premiums, that would be good as well. And I think you can actually get some of that by taking some of the power out of the hands of 
some of these these insurance companies and putting it back into the care uh, into the doctors. Yeah, putting it back into the doctors primarily, because what you're going to do is you're going to create a competition that doesn't exist right now. You're going to create a competition that's going to lower the prices. And so, if doctors are in charge of being or are in charge of being able to charge whatever they want, then that is going to lower the healthcare healthcare insurance premiums in and of itself. So, in surprise billing, I don't know a whole lot about that. I think that's um, cover all pre-existing conditions. I'm a little iffy about covering all pre-existing conditions. At the end of the day, I mean, you know, I, I get it from a humanitarian aspect. I understand that. From an economic aspect, I feel like covering pre-existing pre-existing conditions has probably been one of the reasons why our premiums have been so high. Is that we're now, you know, somebody they don't pay insurance for a long time, then they get something that is extremely expensive to to um, to treat, and they want to go out and then get cheap health care for it, and, and then have it all covered. And at the end of the day. You, you want to be able to provide health care to these people, but the economy still has gears that, that grind, that function it. And you can't jam up the gears without jamming up the whole system. So I'd, I'd have to see a little bit more about how that's going to work. I'm skeptical on that one. Um, protects the Social Security and Medicare. I am a, uh, I, don't, I don't like the way this is worded. I would prefer to see it reform Social Security and Medicare. I think Social Security needs to be privatized. I think people need to be able to choose how their retirement is invested. There, you know, there's, I forget who it was, put out a tweet a few years ago, and he talked about how much he has paid into Social Security, and it was something like over six hundred and fifty thousand dollars. And how if he had, and how if he had put that in the investments that he put the rest of his money in, it would be millions upon millions of dollars that he would now have for his retirement. But instead, now he only gets like three thousand dollars a month or something. So it, people are getting ripped off by the way that our Social Security and Medicare work. And Social Security has essentially been set up as a Ponzi scheme. If anybody ran an investment company the way that, our, that the government runs our Social Security, they would be arrested for running a Ponzi scheme. They would be spending 25 years in prison. So I, I don't think that we should have these certain exemptions where the government is allowed to run certain, certain structures that if the, the populace ran, they would be thrown in prison for. So protect our veterans and provide world-class health care and services. All for that. All for that. I think Trump has already done some things with the with the VA. He's already made some reforms there. He got rid of a lot of people in the VA. And I think he created some sort of VA choice. I don't know a whole lot about the VA. I don't know a whole lot about that. So I don't want to get into specifics because I could be misleading you or just making stuff up. And I don't want to do that. So education. Provide school choice for every child in America. Yes, I am all for school choice. And I don't know what it is with the Democrats' infatuation with, 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 with public schools that have been failing students for decades. And they just want to keep pouring money into them, despite the fact that they are horribly mismanaged. I mean, you, you got a kid who can live on the outskirts of a real shoddy, um, shoddy school district. He maybe even actually live closer to a better school, but he has to go to the shoddy school district just because of where he lives. That is not that is not American. That is not American. We should be able to choose where we send our kids, where we go. So teach American exceptionalism. All for that, yes. Because we have for so long had our entire education system. I mean, for a while, we mostly saw it in, in the university system. But it has now absolutely infiltrated our public school systems. And that is the, the Marxist indoctrination, the, the critical theory education, critical race theory, critical gender theory, critical, they're not talking about grammar, critical grammar theory and critical math theory that talks about how, how certain elements of traditional grammar and math are racist. Get that out of our school system. That is nonsense. That is bullshit. It does not actually do anything to educate students and actually help prepare them for a better life and, to, and prepare them to go out and either start a business or, career, or or get a good job. And that's one thing that we need to start teaching, as well as American exceptionalism, is American entrepreneurialism. Because we are not taught anything like that. We need to learn how our tax code works. In fact, the reason they can't teach how our tax code works is because it's like an 80,000 page book. So we need to simplify our tax code by orders of magnitude. I mean, the, the tax code should be something that any basic American can understand. 
So drain the swamp. I think this should be bold and bold, and I think this is a new new segment here. So all for draining the swamp. Pass congressional term limits. This is something that I am um, I've always liked on one hand and been wary of on another hand. Well, I've now lopped off this wary hand, and I'm all for congressional term limits. Because, you know, it, it will mean that we place a limit on, on people who I think do a really good job. People like Rand Paul, people like Ted Cruz, um, people like, what's his name, Hawley. I keep wanting to say Josh Hawley because that was a player for the Falcons. Uh, and, and, it's, and it's very similar. Uh, but anyways, there, there's Joe Hall. No, oh, it is Josh Hawley. Joe Hawley was the player for the Falcons. Um, so... I, I, I lost my train of thought there. Yes, so we, we have a we do have a good number, uh, or we have a good a handful of people in Congress that I would like to see there for a long time doing good. But the fact of the matter is, is those people are far outnumbered by these people that go in there and they just want the keys of the castle. They just want to hold. They, they just want to get all the benefits of being a senator or being a representative. They don't want to do anything, or they're just straight up crooked. And they have th their career politicians who will just lie, cheat, and steal to maintain their power. But if we put congressional term limits in there, people would actually have to go there knowing that they have a certain amount of time to accomplish their goals. And that's what we want. So in bureaucratic government bullying of U.S. citizens and small businesses. I mean, I'm all for that. I, I, it's, it's a little vague um, exactly what that means. But... Of course, I would love to end bureaucratic government bullying of U.S. citizens and small businesses. I mean, if he's talking about thing, things like going after the McCluskeys for defending their home while letting all of the people who attack them go free, well, yeah, I would like to. I would like to end all that. But I mean, I think this goes more towards businesses and small businesses and deregulating people out of existence. Again, I don't know exactly what that means. I'm gonna. I'm gonna need more information. Expose Washington's money trail and delegate powers back to people and states. Yes, we need to know where a lot of dark money comes from. And this is both sides. This is both Democrats and Republicans. This is not something that you can sit here and say this is really even a conservative argument on. In fact, I mean, you even have a lot of people on the left that want to get money out of politics. I don't know that that's even going to be possible. Because at the end of the day... I mean, even people like, I mean, I don't have a very big following, of course, but you have people that have massive followings. Well, them endorsing somebody is has a monetary value because that person has worked X amount of hours to gain however much following they have, and they're now expending their time, their labor, which has value, which has monetary value in order to endorse candidates. So I don't know. You know, it's, uh, again, I'm no expert on all that, so I think... Um, you know, but we do, we do need to know where a lot of money is coming from, especially when it comes to what we've seen with Black Lives Matter and using Act Blue and whether they have been money laundering, essentially, for the Democratic candidates, for Joe Biden especially. Because we saw out of nowhere, Joe Biden all of a sudden started outraising Donald Trump, who has been shattering records for fundraising. And then out of nowhere, once the Black, Black Lives Matter riot started and, you know, they started taking donations through Act Blue, all of a sudden Joe Biden is raising an inordinate amount of money not buying that. So I do think things like that need to be exposed, and I'm absolutely for giving power back to the people in the states. Drain the globalist swamp by taking on international organizations that hurt American citizens. Yes, I'm all for that. I mean, these are going to be organizations like the World Health Organization, the World Trade Organization, all of these globalist multinational organizations that, I mean, essentially, they come together and you, you have, there's no other outcome than for one of these international organizations to end up being run, overtaken, and fueled by the globalist agenda. And I'm not a globalist. I hate globalism. I am a nationalist. Um, I believe in taking care of your country, let other countries take care of themselves, and we can work at, we can work with allies for, to achieve certain ends and things like that. But at the end of the day, it's America first. Defend our police. Fully fund and hire more... Uh, more police and law enforcement officers, all for that. Increase criminal penalties for assaults on law enforcement officers. Sure, I, I don't know what the penalties are right now. I, I seem to think that they're actually fairly substantial. You, you do get increased penalties if the person you assault is in law enforcement. So I'm not sure how necessary that is. 
but maybe it's uh, maybe it actually has to do with the prosecution of these cases because I think you're starting to see a lot of people who assault cops they they, they get off with almost nothing. Prosecute drive-by shootings as acts of domestic terrorism. I am going to push back against this one. I do not like this idea right here. Drive-by shootings, typically, I mean, they, they've been gang activity. Terrorism, domestic terrorism, has always been political in nature. So I don't like the idea of conflating what seem to be interpersonal struggles or turf wars or things like that being deemed as political in nature. I think this is um, this overreaches a little bit. So bring violent extremist groups, groups like Antifa to justice. Um, <laughs> I would prefer if this said bring violent extremist groups like Antifa to cemeteries, but that's uh, you know that's that's my extreme anti-communist in me coming out. I I, I I hardly view communists as people. And the reason for that is because all of the things that actually define our humanity, which is which is what a lot of the founding is based on, it's it's based on your personal ability to define your own life. Communists don't believe in that. They don't believe in the intrinsic elements of humanity, and so I view them as like golems, not people. <laughs> so I I know that's 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 kind of a uh, and I I mean that in a little bit tongue in cheek as well, but you get what I'm saying. Also, just once you once you become a communist, communism is a radical ideology, and the rates of de-radicalization for uh, for really anybody, just rates of de-radicalization, the failure rate is extremely high. The success rate is under five percent. So, you know, sure, bring them to justice, but at the end of the day, if I don't know how you're going to bring them to justice because I think they're just going to keep popping up. Just because the way that Antifa operates, they operate in a cellular level. Although, at the end of the day, so do a lot of the Islamic uh, extremists and ISIS, but Trump still took them out. So, I would like to see... that. That's what I'd like to see. I'd like to see Antifa treated like ISIS. That's, uh, that, that's the best way to sum it up. So, end cashless bail and keep dangerous criminals locked up until trial. Sure. Sure. I don't have a huge opinion on that. Um, I mean, I, I guess for, for dangerous criminals, people who are in there for violent, the, absolutely keep them, you know, don't, don't do cashless bails. If you get arrested for like weed or, you know, just a drug offense or something like that, sure, let them loose and bring them back to trial. If, if it's a victimless crime and there, you know, some people say there are no victimless crimes, there, there, there essentially are. Um, if it's a victimless crime, something like that, then, then I don't have a big problem with cashless bail, to be honest. So end illegal immigration and protect American workers. All for this? Ooh. Let's see. Block illegal immigrants from becoming eligible for taxpayer-funded welfare, health care, and free college tuition. Yes, there's absolutely no reason why we should be funding people who come across the border illegally. They, they skip the line so that people who actually are trying to follow the rules, it gums up the works for them. Illegal immigration does have victims it, it does it does cause negative consequences for people that are trying to come here and be american as opposed to most of these people who don't do it by the books they're not really here to try to be american i mean i live in los angeles i see the enclaves i you know i, I used to work in an extremely hispanic district that they, they or a, a extremely hispanic area here of la a lot of them do not try to learn english they don't try to em embrace themselves into american culture they form their little enclaves and they just form li like like little Mexicos or little Guatemalas or, or wherever it is they're from. And if you want to come here from one of those countries and you want to come here and wave an American flag and live by the American values and American traditions, I am all for welcoming you in here. But I am not in I am not for people coming into this nation with no regard or no reverence for this nation and then extracting our resources to send back home. Not for that one bit. Mandatory deportation for non-citizen gang members. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, it, I don't think I, I think gang members is even too specific. I, I would like to see that drawn out for. I mean, anybody if, if you're if you're here on if you're here illegally, you should be deported for committing crimes. You know, if you're going to come here, especially if you're going to come here illegally, and then you're not going to respect our laws, get out of here. Get out of here. We don't want you. Dismantle human trafficking net networks. This is a huge one. And I think this is something that Donald Trump has very quietly been doing. We have seen massive reports 
of human trafficking rings, pedophile rings, all of these different things that have been shut down. And I also think that the, the border, this is one of the, big, one of the bigger reasons for the border. I mean, illegal immigration is certainly one of the reasons for the border. Drug smuggling is one of the reasons for the border. But I think human trafficking is a massively overlooked reason for the border wall and for why Trump wanted the wall. And he, he, he'll talk about it, but the media won't talk about him talking about it, and they won't talk about it themselves, which is suspect. Suspect to say the least. So in sanctuary cities and restore our neighborhoods and protect our families. All for that, yes, you know, you're in violation of federal law if you are running a sanctuary city. And so if you want to run a sanctuary city, okay, fine, but you get no money from the government, from the federal government. You are cut off. In fact, you know what? No, it's not fine if you want to run a sanctuary city. We do have federal laws, and you have to follow them. You have to follow our federal immigration laws. You know what? So I'm going to I'm gonna backtrack to what I said a minute ago and say, nope, nope. There, it's not fine if you want to run a, a sanctuary city. You should be out of office if you're looking to run a sanctuary city. Prohibit American companies from replacing United States workers with low-cost foreign workers. Yes. Yes. And... You, you see the tech workers, the, the tech companies do this all the time. They get these H-1B visas or H-1 visas, and they get people that come over from India or Pakistan or, or China. China, too. I mean, God, we, we shouldn't be accepting anybody from China right now. Um, but, but they have these people come over, and they work for much lower wages than Americans will work, despite the fact that they're an American company. But that's the thing is they're, they're not American companies. They, they, are, they are multinational conglomerations based in, on American soil. That's all they are. Uh, so, so I do think that we need to prohibit American companies from replacing our workers. Yeah. And, you know, you know I think we need to do – because you, you, you got a feeling that they're, they're going to counter that by, by moving their base offshores. I don't know. Maybe they would. Maybe they wouldn't. That would, that would be interesting. That would be interesting. But you see, these the reasons I think a lot of these tech companies have been able to make become the, the most the wealthiest companies in the world are because of the way that they, they just import cheap labor. So require new immigrants to be able to support themselves financially. Yes, yes. You cannot come to America and then just put your hand out and say, give me welfare. No. We should only be accepting immigrants to come to contribute to American society. We are not one big welfare state, even though that is how the world has been treating us for a long time. Innovate for the future. Launch Space Force, yes. Establish permanent manned presence on the moon and send the first manned mission to Mars. Yeah, yeah, that sounds awesome. I don't know what we're going to do on the moon. I am, again, no expert on the area. So I don't know what productivity we're going to have on the moon, I guess is what I'm looking to say. Although I'm sure, yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know what we would do on the moon, but I like the idea of it. I like the idea of it. I would like to know, I have a plan for what we're going to the moon for. Either way, I think we should be there. Um, and also, first manned mission to Mars. That would be insane. This is, this is one thing that I think might be interesting you know, they, they always say that whatever technology we have, the government is 80 years ahead of, uh, ahead of us or, or some, something to that effect, 20 years, uh, whatever, whatever it is. Oh, excuse me. I would like to see a lot of these technologies that are, that are kept from us be given to us. And I think we might be spellbound by what kind of technologies actually exist that we have no access to, that we have, we are, we're not privy to. We don't even know what it is. So I would love to see... I would love to see that. You know, send us into the space age for real. Build the world's greatest infrastructure programs. Okay, I don't know what that means really. Um, win, win the race to five G and establish a national high speed wireless internet network. Uh, I mean, of course, if there is a race to five G, we want to be the winners. I'm not a fi again. I'm not a five G conspiracy theorist. I don't know a whole lot about it. I have always been a little bit of a I've always been te technology skeptic, to say the least. You know, I just just because of what it does to us as people, and I mean, you, you know, I can even see it in, in what it's done to me. Just having a screen in front of me all the time, you know, I, I, I don't go out and throw the baseball like I used to, and things like that, uh, and and how it it puts a lot of our social life 
not face to face. And so, so I, I, I have always been weary about some of the, some of the elements of technology, but at the end of the day, there's also some things about technology that are incredibly exciting. So I'm not a, like, I'm not a full on Luddite or anything like that, but it's a balance. So continue to lead the world in access to the cleanest drinking water and cleanest air. That's just a continuation of what is, should, should be an American standard. Partner with other nations to clean up our ocean, our planet's oceans. Sure, all for that. America's America first fo uh, foreign blah 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 blah. America first foreign policy. End endless wars and bring our troops home. Yes, all for that. And you know, it's it's fascinating to understand. And I, I don't even fully understand this. I'd have to do more research. But what a lot of our you a lot of our presence in the Middle East. You know, it's it's right. A lot of it has been about oil. But how much of that has been because we went off of the gold standard and went to the petrodollar and how, uh, you know, having our controlling, controlling the world's oil has actually propped up not only our, I mean, not only our current our economy, but our currency. So, again, I'm no expert on that, but I, I do, I do think that ending the foreign wars, but I, you know, I'm also for ending the Federal Reserve and getting us back onto the gold standard as well. So get allies to pay their fair share. Yep. All for that. We cannot continue to be extracted by people who claim to be our allies, but they just use us for defense, and then they want to hate on us as well. No, no. Pay your fair share. You know that that's uh, it, we're, we're we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna sound like Bernie Sanders to the rest of the world. Go, you need to pay your fair share. Uh, sorry, my my impressions are terrible, but uh, maintain and expand America's unrivaled military strength. Yep. Yep. Again, I don't really want us to be world police, but we should also be the most powerful. Wipe out global terrorists who threaten to harm Americans. Let's uh, let's put global slash domestic, because I you know with the, the domestic terrorism has become with with BLM and Antifa has become far far worse I think than than these global terrorists. Sure, we need to keep. You know, I guess we probably stop a lot of global terrorist plots that we don't even hear about but let's go ahead and add domestic in there too and i think we need to start treating our domestic terrorists like global terrorists because actually i don't know that that's that's a that can create political you know what what happens next you know that when you get you get a democrat in office and all of a sudden they're, they're going to start calling like every militia a terrorist organization so may Something's got to be done, though, and it has to be tied to actions. So, sure, you know, I mean, if a, if a right-wing militia goes out and commits an act of, uh, act of violence um, against Americans, sure, sure, I, I understand, treat them as a terrorist. But the same needs to be said for these Black Lives Matter and Antifa terrorists. And those are the real terrorist threats that we're facing right now in terms of domestic terrorism. It's not coming from the right. Um build a build a great cyber security defense system and missile defense system i think this might be imp more important than a lot of us realize because i think cyber security cyber warfare we've seen several hacks that happened recently like the, the twitter hack that happened recently where they hacked uh what was it joe biden did they, did they hack barack obama i think they hacked barack obama's um twitter as well and i think that was just uh them saying we can do this because you can, if you hack a former president or even a current president or even somebody like, uh, you know, like a Jeff Bezos, if you hack their Twitter account, and you could throw the economy into a tailspin with one tweet. So I do think we need to massively upgrade our cybersecurity and make sure that there is no country in the world that beats us. AI as well. Missile defense system. Yeah, I don't think there's any reason why a missile should be able to reach American shores. I think we should should be able to have sensors for those and be able to shoot any missiles out of the air before they reach America. Um, I think we have the technology to do so. I think we had that technology a long time ago. I think they called it the Star Wars program. Um, again, all of this, you know, like I said, I, I had a couple. I had a couple things that I wasn't a huge fan of or that I had questions about. But for the most part, this is a really, really good platform, and I am, I am on board with it. So, anyways, guys, if you have not liked or if you have not subscribed to this channel, please go ahead and subscribe, like the video, share this. 
Um, we, you know, it, it's, it's good to see that Trump has put out his agenda and it seems like a, a really well thought out agenda. It seems like a strong agenda and it seems like one that we can accomplish as well. So please like this video, subscribe to the channel. Um, you know, drop a comment. Let me know what you think. Let me know what else you want to hear me talk about. Also, don't forget to follow me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and uh, Parlor at Ram Thorburn. And if you are interested in contributing to the channel, which would be greatly appreciated, there are links to my subscribe star Patreon and PayPal down in the description below. Thank you guys for watching, and I hope you'll have a wonderful day.